Hey everyone, before we get on with today's episode, I just want to remind you that our producer, Monday Abu's book, Igala Women, is now on sale on Amazon, so check out the link in the description. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Wisdom Words Podcast. I'm your co-host, Neil Trevedi. Hi, and I'm your co-host, Rini O'Day. Join us every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time as we talk to guests who have stories, advice, life hacks, all of which take you one closer to the feeling of hope. Today, we're joined by someone who was an actress for many years, but perhaps now is playing her greatest role yet, helping so many people get comfortable with their minds and their bodies and their overall well-being. It's an honor to welcome clinical social worker Constance McCashin. Hi, Constance. How are you doing? Hi, Constance. I'm okay. Hi, guys. Welcome hey. to the show. Thank you. Welcome to our Thank show. You. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. Very excited. Like, yeah, I'm not going to fangirl. Uh-uh. No way. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So before we get into your background, can you explain to the audience what psychotherapy is? Uh, psycho. Emphasis on psycho. So <laughs> psychotherapy... Uh, you walk into a room, you close the door, you sit down with a person you've never met before, and you say things you've never said out loud, even to yourself. Wow. How about that? Wow. That is <laughs> the best answer I have ever heard. This is going Cheers. on the yeah. soundbite. Really? Cheers. Yeah. I know that in your bio on your website, it said that you sought out therapy all the way back in 1970s. So... Can you take us back now that you're working in the mental health space today in the 21st century, can you take us back to that era and talk about what was the overall buzz about mental health, if any at all, back then, and how far we've come since then, and the changes that you've seen over the years? Well, I was in an acting class with Larry Moss, who's now Leonardo's. Who is Leonardo? Who could she possibly be talking about? Leonardo's coach on all his movies but I was in Larry's first acting class. And Larry said, you know, you really should be in therapy. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, you mean it shows? But back in those days, being in therapy, other than being an actor in New York or LA, uh, being in therapy had a certain stigma attached to it, right? So, yeah. you know, actors probably were in therapy long before most civilians, but I think that it still was very stigmatizing. So. I did start therapy, thanks to Larry Moss. I also developed a craft, thanks to Larry Moss, and he's still a friend today. And he was wow. right. He said, he said, when I was in his first class, he said, you're kind of like a glazed ham. So I went, mm -hmm. ooh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and so oh I, never, I never cried. I never showed any emotion. I was very mm -hmm. kind of cut off. And um, so therapy was very instrumental in not just freeing me up as an actor, but more importantly, as a, as a person in my real life. And now, unfortunately, well, now I was going to say now, fortunately, it's not as stigmatized, but unfortunately, it's still not as accepted as widely as it should be. And there's still, I think, in certain parts of the world, especially in this country, a certain stigma mm -hmm. attached to going to therapy, especially among certain cultures. Yeah. But it's gotten better. It has gotten way better. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but you know, getting getting parity with medical health in in vis-a-vis -vis <laughs> mental health has been a real struggle, and um, it's very hard to find a therapist now during the it's first pandemic. It's extremely difficult. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's very hard to find a psychiatrist. It's very hard to find, mm -hmm. particularly anyway. in those arenas. You know, anybody who you want to help you with your mental health, especially for kids. There's been a lot in the yeah. press recently about anxiety in adolescents and teens and mm -hmm. younger children. And I think when kids were at home with their parents, they saw, the parents saw up close and personal how the kids were struggling even before the pandemic. And then once mm -hmm. they were home and everybody was around one another a lot more, there was more scrutiny and there was more magnification of problems that were already brewing in the past, but got exacerbated by the pandemic for the parents as well obviously i saw two divorces during the past two years among my uh, patients four suicide attempts um, oh my gosh yeah a lot of oh yeah a lot of stuff that probably might not have happened or at least not happened during such a concentrated period of time 
had we not been on lockdown for two years. Yes, you know? yes, yeah. that was that was extremely difficult, extremely difficult. But here we are on the other side of it. And so, you know, what, um, when and how did you develop an interest in psychotherapy? I mean, you went to therapy and then as, was age discrimination in Hollywood the only, <laughs> the only thing? Or were there other factors as well? As well? Well, I was fired from Knott's Landing during budget cuts, so I thought, oh, my God, I better develop a tangible skill. But no. fortunately, I kept working, and I did other movies. Pardon me, let me get rid of these mm-hmm. ridiculous mm-hmm. ads. Um, you know, I did another series called Brooklyn Bridge for a while. I did a bunch of TV yeah. movies. But while I was doing Brooklyn Bridge, I went to graduate school in Los Angeles at night, and then I worked during the day. My kids were very young. And mm-hmm. then uh, when we moved east because of family issues and older family members that needed me to be here, I got a second Mm -hmm. degree here in Boston. So I think I just realized other than being a Supreme court justice, which was not in the cards for me, (laughs) this is the only (laughs) job you can do until you drop dead. Yeah. Yeah. So I could be sitting in the chair talking to you right now. You were my client and I could just die, and you would never know because you would just keep talking about your problems. And, but, anyway. but are you in therapy? Are you in therapy? Of course I'm in therapy. The whole world okay. should be in therapy. I uh, know. I believe my, it. My, I agree. My therapist is 84, and she was an actress when oh. she started out. And um, oh. I only see her once in a while for a tune-up, but she's amazing. And she's just yeah. a great mentor and a great person for me to emulate. I really admire her as well as value her in my life. You know, I'm, I'm going to sure ask you a ask. question off script because I, I mean, Neil knows what I do. I go off script a lot. When you are playing a character, um, is it difficult in your, like, I know in lots, lots landing you were um, raped. Is that like really difficult do you, do you, is that something to ch- actors struggle with or is it just the craft and you go with it? Well, I think any part you're playing, there are certain pieces of you that are going to be appropriate in terms of what you use for the character and the rest you're going to leave behind. So, you know, that episode was very difficult. Um, and I remember that the wardrobe, mistress at the time was a very young woman who um, had experienced a sexual assault. And she was, this is so many years ago now, I even remember her name. She was lovely. And she was so, um, she was so protective of me. It it, it was really, she was, she was really extraordinary when I think about it. And, um, but I, yeah, look, at one out of four women are sexually assaulted, usually by somebody they know. I think actually mm-hmm. it's one more like one out of three and a half now. So you'd yeah. be hard-pressed to find a woman who reaches her 20s who hasn't perhaps um, experienced something like that, uh, again, unfortunately. So, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Um, is that why um, – I know that a large focus of your practice is people with body issues, right? And it's what attracted you to that particular category of people who are coming over that? Is it because in the entertainment field, you saw a lot of that? I know that you've seen lots of actors who felt insecure, but what specifically drew you to that sort of category of, of patients? Well, when I first started working uh, after grad school, I worked at a university here in Boston, and the woman who ran the eating disorder sort of component of the counseling center couldn't get any of the seasoned clinicians to work with her because a lot of therapists don't want to work with eating disorders because it's such an embedded disorder and it takes so long to get over it. That And yeah. it's just extremely complicated, and they don't want to go there, which is their prerogative. So the director gave me to her to work with and I worked with her for 10 years. So it was like getting a PhD in eating disorders. And then at the same, I had taught acting for four years at the same school. And then I morphed over into the counseling center, which was very similar in some ways. And so a lot of my clients at the counseling center were dancers, actors, writers, artists, people, singers, people who performed. Although now eating disorders are so pervasive that I, you know, they've become so 
I mean, they're ubiquitous, males, females, anybody in between, you know, one of the growing populations struggling with eating disorders are trans men and women because obviously their bodies have changed, even though they feel more at home in their bodies, but they may have experienced the transition in such a way that they have had to get accustomed to being in, in inhabiting a new form, if you will, and that has created some disordered eating. Another big population are women my age, over 60, who, because of the emphasis on youth in this country, they think that thinner is better, whereas Diana Vreeland said, when you, you try to look younger, you look older. So that doesn't mm -hmm. always yeah. work, right? Because right. Right. a woman who gets yeah. too thin when she's over a certain age is very cringy. And um, mm. another growing population are athletes, male yeah. athletes and female athletes. Another, right. obviously, um, gymnasts, ice skaters, swimmers. Also, I've had hockey players, baseball players, football players, um, right. a lot of people who row crew because that mm -hmm. is weight um, determined in terms of your position on the, on the boat. They don't call it right. a boat, though. I forget what they call it. But anyway, um, yeah. yeah, so there's all these pockets where eating disorders are sort of exploding that have mm. nothing to do with the entertainment business, right? You right. Know, nothing. And do you think that so. social media filters, like, make it worse? Because people nowadays, before they put up a picture, they, you know, especially the younger generation, they tend to put like 20 different filters to make sure that it's like picture perfect and it's not real. It's an illusion. But do you think that contributes a lot to that? Well, I think that uh, I would put 20 filters on here if I could, but I'm not going to because <laughs> what's the point? You look great. I mean, you look great. You look, you look no, but I, I'm just yes, saying, you, you know, I, I guess there's two schools of thought, right? I'm going to look the way I really look, no matter how old I am. Right. Or I'm going to somehow doctor this image of myself and look like right. the best version of myself, or the best physical version of myself, or at least what I think the best physical version of myself. But then you get into situations where people lose all perspective and they, nobody is, either they're giving them bad advice or they're not listening to good advice or they are mm. so subjective that they're not seeing what they're ultimately coming up with and not understanding that, although I must say when I saw Judy Dench on camera at the Oscars, I mean, Judy Dench, I mean, obviously she has no ego because when you see her in Belfast, no. there you yeah. could, every wrinkle, every, I mean, you know, she's, I don't know how old Judy Dench is. Then you see her off camera in the audience and she looks spectacular. No. It's like, interesting, uh -huh. just as many males as females have body dysmorphic disorder, it's equal right down the middle. Um, the eating disorder thing tends to swing more female, but just as many males have issues with certain aspects of how they look as females, which mm -hmm. some people find yeah. surprising. You know, it could be mm -hmm. their hairline. It could be their six pack. You know I mean? It could not necessarily Why, be weight. Can, weight can I ask a like, last question on that? Why do you think that you, you said that there are enough males who feel that? Why do you think that, is not out there saying in as far as awareness of that because you said you know, a lot of people find that surprising why why do you think right. that is i there was a huge article in the times a few weeks ago about this subject and about oh. the gym rats the keto diet the very organized way of eating you know there's a lot of ocd in eating disorders because it appeals to the ocd in all of us you know the numbers game right i mean my calorie intake my amount of exercise my yeah. weight my bmi which bmi was started by a person in the insurance business which is ridiculous that they even use it anymore um yeah. so it's it's not it's your sugar about. number you should watch not your bmi so i think there's a lack there's a lack of knowledge. Um, but that's why it's such a stigmatizing and lonely and shameful disorder because people think, mm. oh my God, I'm the only way f a person feeling this way. And of course, that's yeah. anything but the truth. It's, 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 it's not, you're, uh, yeah, it's a very um, widespread disorder. It just still doesn't get talked about as much as it should. And it's certainly not understood it's, it, by a lot of people, including the medical profession. Mm. So that's unfortunate too. Yeah. Wow. You know, they don't see the mental health component. They just say, well, just stop eating. 
or just eat more. You know, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's never about the food. Never mm -hmm. about the food. It well, could be another is. addiction. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an addictive. Yeah. It's an addictive form of behavior. So, if it wasn't an eating disorder, except you need food to survive, it would mm -hmm. be, you know, alcohol, or it would be opioids. It would mm -hmm. be, you know, it would be something mm -hmm. else. But mm -hmm. it's just a coping tool. It's not the only issue. The issue is mm -hmm. obviously what triggered it in the first place. And mm -hmm. anyway, it's mm -hmm. just very complicated and very misunderstood. Right. And you talk about on your website. Uh, that I know you believe a lot, a lot in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Can you explain what it is and exactly how it works? So cognitive behavioral therapy is, this is the example I give my teenagers because they get this. You're, you're outside. Your best friend is way over on the other side of the yard and she's, she's your best friend in the whole world and she's talking to your nemesis. And you're going, oh my God, you're thinking to yourself in your distorted, slightly distorted way of thinking, based on a whiff of reality, they're talking about me. So then when you see your best friend later in the hall, you kind of diss her because you feel that you've been betrayed by her. She doesn't understand what the hell is going on. Why are you treating me like this? I don't understand where this is coming from. So cognitive behavioral therapy is when you perceive a situation or a set of circumstances or a conversation or any interaction and it has a whiff of rationality. Yes, she could have been talking something with this girl that you hate, but she probably wasn't. But you process it in such a way that you immediately go to that negative place and then it affects your behavior. So that stinking thinking, as they call it in AA and Al-Anon, informs your behavior. Your behavior becomes a little off in the eyes of other people. They don't know where this is coming from. And that's where the disconnect happens. I perceive something, I process it, but I process it in a way that's slightly off. It's sort of based in reality, but not, it's my reality. And then I act accordingly and my behavior makes no sense to the outside world. That's why eating disorders, in a more graphic way, I look at myself in the mirror. I think I look really fat. I've distorted my vision of myself, even though my weight is normal, or maybe I'm even underweight because that happens too. women who are anorexic still think they are fat. So therefore mm -hmm. I stop eating or I binge and purge and my behavior yeah. is so erratic, but not to me. So cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy is, is an effort on the part of the therapist and the client to sort of re-educate themselves and how they perceive the world and hence how they process the world and hence how they behave in response to the world. Does that answer your question? That's a great answer. Oh I want to go God. into cognitive behavioral therapy right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you. Oh, man. No, I get it. I and, do. Uh, I know one thing you do, uh, uh, this was stressed on your website, is you do believe in short-term uh, therapy and which is like a series of sessions with but limited. So can you explain the significance and importance of that or why ultimately, right? Any patient can and should get help if they need it. Um, but ultimately, it is dependent on them, right? Your therapist certainly can advise you, can lead you in the right direction. But ultimately, in the real world, it is up to them, right? Well, a good therapist is, I mean, if a, if a client says to you, look, what would you do if you were me? Or how do I solve this problem? You know, a good therapist isn't really going to give them advice because if they go break up with their boyfriend that night and it goes badly, they're going to yeah. come back the next week and say, you know, you told me to break up with him and that was the biggest mistake I could have ever made. So you don't want to mm -hmm. be responsible for those types of decisions. They really have to come from the client. But on the other hand... You want them, it's like an acting class, going back to Larry Moss, who told me to get into therapy as soon as possible. You know, he used to say, look, I want you to stop doing scenes in class where you may be the star of the class, but I want you to take what you're learning here in class, the craft that you're learning here, I want you to take it out there and, and nail that part, get that audition, get the role. Right and then do a great yeah. job in the role. I don't want you to become a professional acting class student because, mm. you know, what's the yeah. point? I mean, you right. want to be out there and, and trying these techniques out and hopefully they'll work for you and hopefully you'll, you'll actually become a working actor. So I think it's the same thing with therapy. 
eventually, not that they can't happen concurrently, but eventually you want them to take what they're learning in therapy and use it in the outside world. I mean, it's right. a little different than acting because they already have the part. <laughs> yeah. So you want them to be using it while they're <laughs> in therapy. But, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, sometimes that works for people. Sometimes it doesn't. I have a client who just came back after 10 years. I have not seen her. And now she's back in therapy again because her life has changed. And a lot of things have happened yeah. in 10 years. So, right. yeah, I mean, I say that because I think if they're really motivated and they're really ripe for therapy, mm-hmm six to 10 sessions could make a huge difference. But right. if they're kind of lost and on the fence and also if their parents are pushing them to be in therapy and they don't want to be there, that's always fun. Um, mm-hmm. It could take longer, you know? I mean, yeah. I really don't want someone to be in therapy with me for like years and years and years. I don't think right. that, I mean, right. I think they should take a break, utilize mm-hmm. what they've learned and yeah, right. maybe come back for a tune up or something, but, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, because it, it, right in a way, it's like if if they have to keep coming back to you, like you mentioned, like for so many years, that means clearly there's a lack somewhere, not necessarily on your either on your part or their part, or but clearly something is not synchronizing. If that would be the case, right? If they kept coming, for, especially for the same issue, it's understandable. If maybe now it's a different issue that they're dealing with, but you know. So, well, yeah, you know. There's a lot more isolation out there. There's a lot more um, deprivation of, of emotional content and connection with other people. So, I, I mean, some yeah. people come to therapy because I'm the only social interaction of any substance they have during the week. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. rare, but that's yeah. definitely the case with a few people that I see. So, or they come as needed. They come PRN. They come once right. in a while they don't come consistently weekly or bi-weekly. So, I mean, obviously everyone's needs are different and you're not going to yeah. terminate somebody because you, you know, you're tired of hearing the same whining story all the time. But yeah. sometimes I do say to them, you know, is this really working? Because I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I feel like maybe, maybe I'm not, I mean, I always talk to people for 20 to 30 minutes before we even begin using their insurance because I try to weed out people that I feel are not going to be a good fit and they should be doing the same thing. So, mm-hmm. but sometimes they slip through those cracks, you know, some of these people that are just not, it's just not a good fit. I'm not for everybody. Or as my t-shirt, my husband made says, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And <laughs> I'm the first one to say to them, look, I don't think this is working, you know, mm-hmm. and I'll help you mm-hmm. find somebody else. Well, my husband calls my style performative therapy. So I tell my, I tell my potential clients, if you, have a, if you have no sense of humor, this is never going to work. And if you don't like dogs, this is never going to work. My, I've got five, and they're, they're fighting yeah. right now. I have five dogs, and they're fighting right now. Yeah. And you mentioned humor. Is that something that you do more often than not in your uh, practice? Well, I'm very irreverent and unorthodox in life and in my approach. So I thought Knott's Landing was a comedy. Maybe that's why they let me go, because I thought it was pretty funny <laughs> a lot of the time. But anyway, so um, I, she does find have a sense of humor. I find that when I'm working with, I work with a lot of teenagers, a lot of people in college, their 20s, 30s, and they think I'm really funny. I don't know whether I remind them of their crazy grandmother or something, but they laugh. I mean, if I leave them laughing, if they start out at the top of the 45 minutes miserable and crying, mm-hmm. and I can always tell I, at hello what they're feeling. I can mm-hmm. tell by their body right. language. I can, tell, mm-hmm. I can tell immediately when I see them. When I was in my mm-hmm. office more frequently, I could tell them. I could tell when I went down the hallway and saw them in the chair before they even saw me coming what kind of a day they were having. But if they're laughing at the end of it, I go, I say, look, you know what? This wasn't a total waste of time. I said, you're laughing. I said, I said, this is great. You know, I also use bad language, which I really need to curb. But, you know, I'm so old right now. Who gives a shit? So I I just don't care. I just don't care. I have the mouth of a truck driver. So, you know, I mean, I think it's just, (laughs) you know, whatever. So do you miss acting? Do you miss I miss the, I, I, I miss the money, baby. If I was making oh, the bet. same money now <laughs> as a therapist, oh my God, oh my God, that would be so great. Yeah. But 
I still do pretty uh, darn well, so I have not I much bet. to complain uh, about. I bet. I uh, bet. Can you name maybe like one or two things that you feel that patients, first of all, with mental health, struggling with mental health, should know about therapists? And also, I guess this is like a two-part question, maybe two things, two or three things that we can do, people outside the medical profession, to keep increasing that awareness of uh, mental health issues. Because like you said, right, that it, although it has come a long way since the 1970s, you believe that it's still not as much as we, not as much awareness as there could be? Well, I think there's a new series with Harrison Ford coming on called Shrinking. Based on what I read about it, I think there's a lot of inappropriate, untoward behavior that's going to go on in this series. So I, that's probably not a great indicator of what it should be. But, mm. I, you know, some of the best shrinks in the media have been um, Robin Williams in Good Will Hunting, I thought was great. Although he did hug his patient, which he shouldn't have done. Why um, is it inappropriate I, for a therapist to hug their patient? You really shouldn't touch your patients any more than you really? should touch a child in school. Yeah, you really shouldn't. Because okay. Okay. first of all, if you're, dealing, if you're dealing with people that are not stable mm -hmm. and that hug gets misinterpreted, you could have mm. a malpractice suit on your hands. I get it. It, it's, a, yeah. it's a very foolish thing to do. You don't hug your patient. You, don't, you really don't touch them. You know, hopefully you touch them emotionally, but you don't touch them. But in terms I'm of advice, hugger. Neil... Well, then you're not a therapist. But in terms of um, <laughs> advice, um, I tell my clients who have been sexually assaulted a great, well, there's a few sentences that I've used. One of them is no is a complete sentence, which is a great thing to live by. Yeah. One is um, uh, <laughs> my favorite quote from Gloria Steinem. A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle, which is a great mm -hmm. quote. Um, another one is Freud said, an apology with a rationalization is not an apology. How many people say to you, oh my God, I'm so sorry I'm late, but. Oh my mm -hmm. God, I'm so sorry I did that, but. There's always yeah. the but, so it's, it waters the whole thing down. And then my right. most favorite quote, which has nothing to do with therapy. Well, I guess it has something to do with therapy. A man unzips his fly and his brains fall out. <laughs> ba -dum -bum. Ba -dum -bum. So those, those are my favorite <laughs> expressions. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, that. um, that's probably a good place to close on this because that was freaking funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't say the F word. I said freaking. So um, can you, uh, can you, uh, can you tell people, our audience, where to find you, your website? Do you have social media? I have a Twitter account, which is mostly about um, social justice, mental health, a little showbiz, mm -hmm. not much. And also my doodle, because that's important. Um, yeah, it's mostly about mental health and social justice. Mm -hmm. and, that's how we, um, that's how I you started following mm -hmm. me two and a half yeah. years ago and I was very surprised that the Constance McCashin is following me. Well, <laughs> it was a very don't, pleasant surprise, but a surprise nonetheless. You are a great guy. I, you, will you stop that? You are a great guy. How did you two guys meet? Because you're like an oh. old married couple. You talk over each other oh like some God. of the couples I see in therapy. Yeah. Well, I've been married 31 years, so I'm good at talking over people. Yeah. Neil, how did we meet? Twitter. We, uh, we used to uh, be involved <laughs> with this website. Before this was a podcast, it was a mental health website called dailywisdomword.com, where I was a writer. And our producer and uh, one of the site moderators, he had the idea that why don't we spin off into a podcast? Um, and that's how we went through a number of people. First, it was so-and-so and so-and-so. No, maybe it's so and so and so and so before it got down to me and reading. So that's how. It was yes, I talk excited. a lot. Yeah, and he's and he's brilliant. So. And then Basically. I edit her out in the post, so <laughs> it all works out. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> you think he's kidding? You think he's kidding? He's not kidding. And I love yeah. him for that because you know, <laughs> things come out of my mouth that should stay in my shoe. Oh. Is there hope, in your opinion, on the horizon? What? Hope for you and I? Yeah, or hope for just the world in general? <laughs> for me, first Or just all, about eating you know, disorders? Uh, no, I don't mental, know. You mean just mental hope? Mental health awareness. <laughs> awareness. There's oh, always hope. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. I think <laughs> as, as, as we purchase more guns and as we are becoming more and more vocal about our um, hatred for other people, I think that it is, um, I think that it's probably, you know, the people that should go to therapy don't go to therapy. So everybody needs know. therapy. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Well, hopefully there's always hope. And with yeah. people like you, you bring that yeah. to people, you help them. And I have so much respect for that. And mm -hmm. um, we have enjoyed this conversation so much. You Thanks, are guys. a riot. You're a riot. Oh, yeah. you really I'm a riot. Are. That's you me. You're, you're laughing yeah. in it. <laughs> My husband tells me, he tells me I'm a loose cannon. That's what he tells me. But oh, I have to be careful because I, yeah. I don't know you guys very well. So I have to, be, I have to behave no. myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I have, yeah. Anyway, so thank you yeah. so much. You're very welcome. Enjoy your day. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Really, yeah. Glad it worked it's been out. A joy. Bye, bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Constance, for being a wonderful guest this week. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at all the links listed in the description. And don't forget to hit like on this video and subscribe to this channel so you never miss an episode. Thank you, everyone, once again. And we will see you right here next week at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Goodbye. Bye.